in North Carolina. And yeah, I've always been very involved in, in, in politics. I grew up here in this area, and my family has been in this area for over 100 years. And I went to school at the University of North Carolina. I care a tremendous amount about this state and, of course, about this country. And in, in 2016, you know, I found myself in a position where I recognized some complacence in myself um, with, with what happened in 2016. I thought it was in the bag that we'd continue to move forward with a forward-thinking president uh, who was interested in continuing to build this nation up and lead us in a positive way. And, of course, that didn't happen uh, in 2016. So I committed myself at that point. Uh, I had been committed before, but I committed myself to step it up even more. And that translated into me really looking at uh, whether or not uh, I should run for, an, for office. Uh, someone said, hey, you've really got to look at running for Congress in this district. And, and I said, okay. <laughs> but at first, I kind of laughed it off because I'm 28 years old. Uh, and at the time, I was definitely and, and may still be the youngest congressional candidate in the United States. I was actually 27 then. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a businessman. I've worked in 30 states. Uh, my focus is really change management, helping people through change. How do we, in particular, retrain uh, workers, given how much technology is coming into practically every industry? And so that, that's what I do for a living. And, and I said, you know what? I feel like that's, that's something there's not a lot of appreciation for in Washington. So it wasn't just about the change in the direction of the country that, that we all felt tangibly from this 2016 election. It was also the fact that Congress is the oldest on average it's ever been in this country. I work in kind of the bridge between business and technology, um, helping translate business needs to technology and technology needs to business and preparing workers for how that's going to impact people. And that is impacting people in every single way today. And we need people to really look forward to how that's going to continue to challenge us in education, in healthcare, and, and in our economy, among other things. So that's how I decided all right, I'm going to investigate it. I'm going to, I'm going to learn what, it would, what it's going to take uh, to, to do this successfully. And here we are, you know, 40, 49 days or 48 days, I guess, maybe now uh, before November 6th. So I'm very excited uh, and I'm very excited with, with what November can bring for, for this country. So North Carolina has famously very gerrymandered districts. <laughs> which the Supreme Court has uh, not yet quite managed to uh, to deal with. So this district has been represented by a Republican since 1985. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what what it looks like? What are the demographics of the district look like? What is the is the voting history as Republican as that would make it seem? And, the, and then sort of what is your path to victory in all of that? Uh, let me start with the last part of your question. This district has more Democrats than Republicans by about 50 or 60,000. There are 50 or 60,000 more Democrats in this district than Republicans. So the path to victory is getting out the vote. And so for all of the punditry and all of the talking heads that there are on every channel, on every, you know, on every form of media possible, the reality is that politics is really as simple as who goes and votes. Now, that kind of is a segue into the gerrymandering conversation because while there is gerrymandering here in this district, in fact, um, in this district and in the neighboring district, we have the only college campus in America that is in two separate congressional districts. They drew a line mm -hmm. right through the largest historically black college and university, North Carolina a and It is the only college campus in the country in two separate congressional districts, literally right down the middle. So there is gerrymandering there, but that's not the whole story in North Carolina because it's not just about gerrymandering. It's also about some really dangerous policies that have been passed by the North Carolina state legislature. They have actually closed a number of polling places. They didn't do it themselves, but what they did is they gave the county board of elections across the state a mandate that said if you're going to open polling places for early voting, they have to be open every single day during the early voting period, which in North Carolina runs from October the 17th until November the 3rd. 
what counties had had done as early as the primary this May, this past May, is counties would open up, you know, a, a voting site for one day, like on a Saturday, to really expand the options for people to vote. And what this new rule has created since May is that that certain counties aren't opening voting locations for just the one day because they're not allowed to. So we've actually seen polling places removed from early voting. And so it's not just about the gerrymandering. It's also about voter suppression. It's happening kind of under the radar. It's flying a little under the radar, but it's something that's really important to point out because I know the same conversation happened in Georgia um, just a a month or so ago uh, that it got reversed because we called it out. And so I wanted to make sure I highlighted that, but just to kind of wrap up your, on your question, there is gerrymandering 2019. It sounds like we will have new districts. We did not get new districts for 2018 because it was too close to election day, according to the lawsuit. And the path to victory is when we vote, we win. People are fired up in this district it's just about getting out the vote and making sure people know that there's a better option on the ballot this fall and they don't have to keep voting the same way because we are seeing that our representative currently really has voted against the best interest of this district time and time again. The guy before him was a pretty well liked guy on both sides of the aisle. It's not that this is such a, a red, red, red district. It's that the other guy was a bipartisan guy. He was very well liked by people on both sides in this district. This new guy comes across as a nice guy, but his voting record is malicious. And that is what we're trying to highlight to people across the district. So right now, uh, North Carolina is experiencing Hurricane Florence, and hurricanes have been getting stronger, probably as a result of climate change, moving more slowly and dumping more water and getting larger. And I know that North Carolina is also has a lot of green jobs, right? They they have a lot of solar jobs. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your platform for protecting the climate and sort of growing the green industry. Well, I think number one is North Carolina has really suffered uh, from this administration's tariff on solar cells. Um, mm-hmm. There were thousands of jobs slated uh, to be created in North Carolina from the tremendous growth, as you point out, that there has been in the solar industry. But that tariff has actually tremendously slowed and even halted some of those projects. So we've got to start by by really assessing those tariffs and, and calling those into question, which is something that Congress has the ability to put a check and a balance on, which they are failing to do in this Congress. So, But setting that aside, I think it's a tremendous misnomer that the oil and gas and coal industries create a, a ton of jobs um, when, in fact, uh, the, the solar and wind industries are capable of producing just as many, if not more, jobs. Uh, and the jobs aren't just in building uh, the solar farms or, or wind farms themselves. Uh, they're actually a tremendous number of jobs in maintenance on an ongoing basis. And so um, I've actually done a lot of work in the energy field, particularly around sustainability initiatives. And I've even been a part of retraining workers who are moving from a fossil fuel plant to a new site where green energy is being produced. I've been involved in that work. And so, you know, I I do feel the pain of coal miners in West Virginia who are upset about losing their jobs. Uh, A lot of their jobs, by the way, have gone by the way of automation, not by way of uh, a lack of, of use of coal in the country. But I've got a a platform that is designed not only to invest in the green energy economy of the future, but to also invest in America's workforce, to retrain them and even provide incentives and and subsidies for moving because there are jobs unfilled across the country. And many families can't leave places like Charleston, West Virginia, to come to North Carolina, where we are in need of workers because they can't afford to move. And so there's, there is no economic mobility happening in the working and middle class, uh, even in, in America today. And we can get this country back to work. It's already unemployment is low, but we can make sure that people have economic mobility so they can go and find jobs that are prepared to pay sometimes double or triple what many Americans make today. Uh, and so that is something that 
that I want to, us to really look forward to the opportunities that are ahead of us, not just the obstacles that are ahead of us, but the opportunities. Uh, and that's just not something our Congress is doing. We're not proactive. We're not even really reactive. We're just inactive in light of changing global times. Your Facebook events page is just filled with events, <laughs> canvassing and <laughs> town halls and meet and greets. And I particularly like the one coming up this weekend with donuts and coffee. Side note, anyone wants me to go out and canvas, give me some donuts first. Uh, so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm wondering with all of this, uh, talking to people and having your team talk to people, what are the kinds of things you're, you're hearing from the constituents of the district? What are the kinds of things that they're really worried about right now? There's almost several different sections of that answer. Um, the first is the, the, the base, the Democratic Party base, who is really, the best word is afraid uh, of, of what this administration is doing and, and perplexed that there aren't people in Washington, re Republican and Democrat, who aren't standing up to some of the divisiveness and hateful uh, actions of this administration. and. I always say I don't dislike Donald Trump or my opponent, Mark Walker, because they're Republicans. My dad and my stepmom are Republicans. So if I hate or dislike someone because of their political party, I would hate members or dislike members of my own family. And that's just not the case. And, and so I dislike them because of their hatefulness and, and, and their divisiveness and the rhetoric and bigotry and homophobia and all these things that – that surround uh, what they talk about on a daily basis. And so that's, that's one segment. The second segment is, is really the independent voters, and that, that represents almost a third of the district. And the independent voters are sitting there and they're saying, well, you know, I keep hearing that the economy is doing well and that unemployment is low, but my bottom line isn't any better. You know, the, the president can keep talking about the stock market, but... 80% of the stock market in America is owned by 10% of the people. Well, that's not helping most, most folks. Wages are stagnant. The grocery bills keep going up. So they're sitting there and they're perplexed because they're like, I feel like I'm supposed to like what's going on in the country, but my health care keeps getting more expensive and even is, is at risk of being ripped away. And I'm, I don't like some of this rhetoric I'm hearing. So that's the other thing. And then Republicans there's two types of Republicans out there, and I don't know how to assign percentages to it, but one group of Republicans immediately turns off as soon as they hear that I'm a Democrat. And then the other segment, I managed to get through at least a couple sentences, and I say, look, I know, you know, I know you're a Republican, but I wanted to call you and introduce myself to you anyway. Or, or I knock on a Republican door and say, I know I'm not necessarily supposed to come knock on your door today, but I just wanted to introduce myself because I'm a Democrat. I'm running for Congress. I know you're a Republican, but I got to tell you, my dad and my stepmom are Republicans. I come, I've been reaching across the aisle in my family my entire life, and I believe that we have a vision that can benefit the people of this district, yourself included. And when, when they hear that, they say, hmm, okay, well, tell me more. And as soon as we get our foot in the door, and, and we have a chance to spend a couple of moments with those types of people who are open and willing to hear from the other side, they, their eyes widen because they realize that this, this oh, all of these, all of these progressives and liberals, you know, they're all socialists and whatever, you know, whatever that um, nonsense is that they've been, they, they've been feeding folks. When they realize it's not true and that my values are their values and that I'm for inclusiveness and bringing people together – they say, huh, that doesn't sound like what I've heard before, and I would really like to elect some younger folks to Congress because that's who needs to be up there these days. The range of interactions is amazing, but what I'm most, most happy about is that most people we talk to really are open to it and know just how important this year's election is. Are there other things that you would like to make sure that we talk about? You know, my opponent... And in fact, it seems like it, it's the theme of the year. I don't know how to describe this phenomenon that's going on this year, but my opponent will not agree to debate me. Um, in fact, we heard from the, one of the TV stations in Greensboro today that they had not even responded uh, to the debate request that was sent to both me and my opponent. And that is true, not just in my race, but of many other races, congressional and state legislative races that are going on. And so 
regardless of their motivation for not responding or refusing the debate, I think it's really important to say that members of Congress, especially in a jury,